Hey, welcome to Optimize Your Body with Martin Silva, where we talk raw, uncut facts to truly help you optimize your body. Hey, folks, so I have a very, another very interesting guest on today. Her name is uh, Dr. Narala Jacoby, and she is a, a gut specialist, gut health specialist, and specializes mainly in SIBO, which we'll, we'll come to uh, very soon. But she's very, very well first, and she's, a, she's an expert in her field, so there's going to be lots of sound advice here for you guys so um yeah how are you doing today today Norella? i'm great thanks for inviting me no problem yeah mm-hmm. so um yeah if you could just explain i was just going to get straight into it because i know your time is limited and i was just going to see uh if you could just explain in layman terms kindly uh, what the gut is and like what its main functions are i guess or whatever's easier for you really yeah sure let's kind of start with Um, a healthy gut, if you will. Um, But we we all know that the gut is really important. It's it's there to help us digest our food and um, actually absorb nutrients and uh, make us healthy and basically extract as much nutrients from the food as possible. So, and my function really is um, to help people with digestive disorders, whether that's IBS or you know, irritable bowel syndrome or SIBO, which is a bacterial overgrowth in the upper gut or constipation, diarrhea, etc. And it's, you know, when we think about uh, digestive health, we, we have this incredibly long tube that's essentially, if you were to yank it out of your body and spread it out, it's the surface area of a double tennis court. And that is inside of you trying to extract as many nutrients as possible. And if that's not working, uh, no, you know, no matter how hard you work out, it's, you're just not going to be optimally healthy. So gut health is sort of a new buzzword with a lot of um, um, researchers looking at the microbiome, for example, and um, healthy eating, of course, has been very popular in for, for many years. But it just seems like more and more people are actually interested in digestive health, which is music to my ears, of course, because I've been preaching this for over 20 years. So, yeah, it's, it's a good day to be um, a gut health um, specialist. Awesome. Yeah, it's very, very exciting. And I'm so excited to have you on the show, to be honest, because it's only over the last year or two where I've really started focusing on uh, health and well-being, as opposed to just be driven driven by aesthetics because of my bodybuilding background. And yeah, I've just read some books on it. And I was going to ask you on, on that note there, kind of like i guess it's a broad question but what signs like people should look out for um which could indicate they they have gut issues or food intolerances i know that's quite a broad question but yeah no it's a great question because that's exactly the kind of thing that people don't often actually um think about food allergies for example when they have eczema or or you know if they have some sort of bacterial overgrowth and they have psoriasis but the most common symptom that i think also pertains to your listeners because i have a lot of um not just bodybuilders uh but people really into their physique and bloating i think is probably one of the most common symptoms which is of course such a difficult thing to overcome if you're um, actually competing and you're you're on stage and you have this little pot belly that doesn't really, people really get very stressed out about that. So bloating after meals is probably one of the most common complaint. It doesn't sometimes even have to be after meals. It can just be sort of worsening as the day progresses. And that could range, like, you know, the symptoms of that or the causes of that could range from that you're just eating too much protein for your particular body type. And I know that um, protein is a very valued, uh, you know, food source for most of the um, bodybuilders. But it, it, if you don't have a particular constitution that allows you to really process and digest that correctly, which usually starts in the stomach with hydrochloric acid, and then as um, that protein, let's say you had a steak, um, you have to first break that down with stomach acid. Then that gets passed into the small intestine where the pancreatic enzymes act upon it. And so as it traverses down this long tube, essentially by the time it reaches the colon, not much should be left of that steak. But if you've overwhelmed your ability to break that down, you will have some of that steak left in the colon and you can have it putrefy there. So very often bloating is the result, 
brain fog can be the can be the result really smelly gas can be the result so those are the kinds of symptoms that very much are uh, associated with just basically I mean, it could be anything could be could be that you've overwhelmed your digestive tract with protein it could be that you just generally don't have enough digestive juices it could be that you have bacterial overgrowth so this is this is my job is where i then um ferret out what exactly the problem is oh great and i was just going to ask you about in terms of protein that's great that you mentioned that because whilst i was competing and also just constantly dieting down and stuff for different modeling shoots and whatnot i was just pumping my and, and even when i wasn't doing that actually i was uneducated like most people and i was pumping my body i was having probably three four times the amount of protein i needed and that was literally for about probably about three or four years and mm -hmm. um i'm 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 pretty certain i've done some damage to my gut because it's, it's very ironic actually but my gut's been absolutely great for for quite some time now but um actually Yesterday, I had a flare up, and today it's really, really bad. And I'm trying to put my finger on what it is. And uh, for a while, I was having major issues about um, six months to 12 months ago. Um, so, yeah, in terms of eating too much protein, I mean, what would you say? How would you explain to the listeners, like, too, you know, um, I know everyone's different and it depends on what their lifestyle is and stuff, but how much is too much? Well, again, it depends on your weight and on your size. And if you like, typically men do require a small amount more than women in terms of muscle mass. But, mm. um, you know, when I see bodybuilders or people that are in competitions, they basically just live off of protein. And mm. so if you have, you know, 100 grams of chicken breast in the morning and then whey protein for, you know, two, three snacks a day, and then animal products all the way throughout, and you're getting maybe 200 grams of protein, that's way too much for your body to um, to actually process. And so the, the idea is you're only going to build muscle with protein that you can actually absorb. So it doesn't matter how much you douse your body with protein. If you cannot digest it, you're not going anywhere with that protein. And it's interesting that you talk about that because – a lot of bodybuilders are still of that notion that you have to just protein, protein, protein. So it's really nice to hear that you actually don't advise your listeners to, to follow suit. You basically still, you know, you do require a bit more protein if you're obviously wanting to get the results. But it's always um, within reason. You know, I mean, I know vegan bodybuilders that, that, that don't eat a fraction of some of the others, but again, I'm not an expert in, mm. in uh, exercise fitness. I'm more looking at digestive health. So, um, so like 200, 300 grams of protein for somebody that has the cast iron stomach acid, that might be fine digestively. I would argue that also if you eat 200 to 300 grams of protein a day, pure protein, not like 300 grams of chicken breast, that you become that your body becomes too acidic. Mm -hmm. because animal protein tends to be very, very acidic. And what that means is um, you, you, it's, it actually increases the acidity of your blood. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, your body actually, in order to buffer the acidity of the blood, has to pull out minerals from your bones. Uh -huh. um, and so what we see is um, actually we see a much higher um, level of osteoporosis in cultures that, uh, you know, like Western countries that eat a lot of animal products. So it's all the, my golden rule is always if you eat a lot of animal protein, you must also eat um, the equivalent, if not much more vegetable protein or vegetable matter. Mm. So if you have a steak, you, you know, on a third of your plate is the steak the other two thirds should be vegetables just to even even out the playing field. Because when we look back in, in, you know, what we used to do in uh, paleolithic times is it wasn't just the paleo diet. It was meat. Yes. But then we went through long periods of where we didn't have that available and we would eat tubers. We would eat lots and lots of fiber. We'd eat lots of vegetables. And so that meat was always counterbalanced with um, a very huge amount of, vegetables that contain a lot of potassium and a lot of other nutrients that really um, buffer out this acidity, which is a big issue for some people. So if you, for example, are somebody who gets a very sore after exercise, um, you might actually just be too acidic because lactic acid, of course, is also another acid factor that mm. increases acidity. So you know, if you can't get over being sore like, um, some, like your teammate, 
you might think that you might just have to really increase your vegetable consumption. Mm. Yeah, interesting. And in t- uh, talking about vegetables, as I've said time and time again on this podcast, it was an absolute game changer when I started increasing the amount and, and also varying the amount of plants I was eating. It, everything uh-huh. just changed. I mean, I went from kind of having a really bad relationship with food to actually my body intuitively goes for those foods now, for vegetables. Like broccoli is my go-to. I know it's a very kind of a, that's a very uh, conventional kind of thing for a bodybuilder to eat, but um, that's just an example. And I was going to say how I know fiber plays a huge part in uh, gut health and longevity when it comes to just all-around health. How important is fiber? And could you briefly maybe explain the different types of fiber in layman's terms and like maybe some examples of some food sources if possible? I know that was tough. I asked you about 10 questions at one second. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Sure. The, imp- sure. the, the importance so, of fiber. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Where do we go? Okay. Uh, all right. So fiber is, uh, and it, you know, it is really important, but it's actually interesting because my area of, of expertise and specialty is IBS and SIBO. And for SIBO, we're actually trying to minimize fiber. What we'll get, we'll get to that. But let's imagine, let's go back to, um, why are we all talking about vegetables and fibers? It's because you have about three kilos of gut bacteria in your system right now. You, so if you just took out three kilos of you, that would be the, the amount, the sheer volume of bacteria that inhabit mainly your large intestine and to some extent in much lesser amount, your small intestine. And what do they do there? They are um, incredibly important to help you with uh, nutrient absorption, nutrient production. Um, They ferment different fibers into what are called short-chain fatty acids like butyric acid and propionate. And a whopping 20% of your daily energy is actually produced by these bacteria that are living in your digestive tract. So these bacteria, uh, we want to help them grow, right? We want to help them actually build... um, sort of like a rainforest in your digestive tract that has this um, really important function of gut healing, immune um, stimulation, uh, also energy production, as I've mentioned. So a lot of different reasons why we want a healthy microbiome. And the microbiome is the term given to this huge amount of bacteria that live in your gut. And if you feed it nothing but meat and fat, you will grow much more the um, the phylum called Bacteroidetes, which are a particular type of phylum that actually increase, um, you know, they love meat and they love fat and things like that. So you really change with your diet what your microbiome looks like. So if you feed them a lot more vegetables, um, you have a lot more diversity in your um, in your microbiome. And diversity is the name of the game when we're talking about a healthy gut bacteria. So fibers and plant materials is really what we have uh, co-evolved with, with our microbiome. So that's their preferred food is vegetable plants or vegetable matter in, in terms of fiber. So we have soluble fiber and insoluble fiber, and both of those are really helpful. The insoluble fiber, which is mostly cellulose, the hard stem, you know, the skin on the stem of the broccoli, for example, um, that's a little bit harder to digest for humans. Um, and so, it, we, but it's still pretty good for, for particular um, uh, bacteria, but it also acts as a bulking agent for your stool so that you can actually have a nice, big, normal bowel movement. But the insoluble fiber, which is found more in apples and um, in, in other vegetables, I mean, lots of vegetables have both soluble and insoluble fiber, but the insoluble fiber is an excellent prebiotic, which is a food for uh, beneficial bacteria. And if you get really, really gassy, if you are eating a lot of fiber, it means that all of a sudden you're just, they're having a party and you might have to cut back a little bit um, because the idea is not to get really symptomatic with gas, but the idea is just to have the right amount of fiber for your digestive tract so you can grow this healthy microbiome. Mm, Awesome. And uh, yeah, have you got any examples of, you know, vegetables, for example, and is there any other kinds of foods you promote to people? I don't know, such as like, I know people say that uh, lentils and kind of legumes are really important. What would you say are the, the top of the list? I know vegetables are probably number one or plants, but... 
Well, well, legumes and rice and grains are all plant-based, mm-hmm. right? So you can you can sort of argue that all of that is that you have basically plants and non-plants, right? Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. you have you know all the animal products are now non-plants. So all the plants are very uh, helpful, and most of them do have some. Um, what are uh, what are called well not just fibers but also phytonutrients which are vitamins and nutrients found only in plants and fibers I think the probably star of the show would definitely be legumes they're extremely rich in fiber mm-hmm. uh, so, uh, legumes such as beans, just to give the audience sorry like black beans for example okay. black beans Great. are fabulous um, and so you know if you want to just sort of uh, transition maybe and maybe replace some of the foods that you're eating now with plants or with fibrous um, ve- uh, vegetables and legumes. You can do things like, um, you know, celery sticks with hummus, for example, is a great snack. Um, or using, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I like Mexican food. So things like the black beans, you can get them in tins or cans and you, w- you would sort of drain the water out and you can sprinkle just even starting slowly usually with legumes and, and lentils and beans because they are very gas forming and those that are not used to it. But mm-hmm. as you build up your tolerance, that should get easier and easier. And um, other like celery is a great plant that has or vegetable that has a lot of fiber um, you mentioned broccoli, all of the brassica vegetables, the cauliflower, broccoli, kale, they're all fabulous with fiber. Um, and then the grains, if you're looking at uh, brown rice, quinoa, um, anything that's still in its whole form is really good to incorporate as well into your diet. Awesome. You explained that really well. Thanks for that. Yeah, so just move forward a little bit. Could you... Um, Actually, I wanted to go a bit more into uh, what you specialize in actually in SIBO and what are the most common, obviously I know you specialize in SIBO, but what are the most common gut disorders or digestive disorders that you deal with, Noella? Okay, so it's, I mean, obviously because my website is the SIBO doctor, it's going to mm-hmm. be my my specialty and I've dealt with SIBO when, uh, you know, when it first started to hit the um, alternative medicine airwaves and also the conventional airwaves and a lot I mean the conventional airwaves in terms of gastroenterologists they're still woefully behind when it comes to actually taking SIBO seriously but in a nutshell maybe a lot of people have heard of irritable bowel syndrome where um, you have cramping you have gas you might have diarrhea you might have constipation or alternating bowel patterns someday diarrhea, someday constipation, and you just feel like you're mostly unsettled all the time. Um, And for the longest time, uh, they were, you know, patients were told to just eat fiber and live with it, but fiber would make them actually worse. And so SIBO is a condition that is part of the spectrum of IBS. um, And it basically where bacteria that are normally found in your large intestine. I've just uh, talked about how the microbiome is really important in your large intestine and to some extent in much smaller amount in the small intestine. But basically, it's a, SIBO is a condition where you have tremendous bacterial overgrowth in the wrong location. And that really leads to malabsorption. It leads to tremendous bloating and abdominal cramping, lots of fatigue, lots of brain fog. Um, maybe you have diarrhea, maybe you have constipation, or again, the alternating back and forth. And so still a lot of gut symptoms, but it's a really treatable condition because essentially if we figure out what caused it and, um, but, and then killing the bacteria, that's curable. That is what we're going for. And so a lot of people that have suffered with this condition for a long time are, you know, finally able to eat normally again and live a normal life, um, even though they were stuck in their house for many years because of these these digestive disorders. Mm. So that part is really fun um, and really rewarding. But people, you know, people have either mild cases or intermediate cases or really, really tough cases. Mm -hmm. So I deal with that whole spectrum. But yeah, SIBO is, you can take a quiz. um, If you go to SIBOtest.com, there is a quiz just to see if you have SIBO. And it can give you an idea whether or not you fit the category, if if any of what I've just said sort of rings a bell for you. Yeah, so it's obviously a lot more common, I guess, than what people think because, uh, as you say, it's like a new age now. And with all the studies coming out and all the time and effort you've put into 
applying yourself and learning about this, I guess uh, now is a great time for you to actually, you know, reach out and help people because a lot of the time, I guess, people um, can't kind of connect the dots because it's so complex, isn't it? And people think that... Anyway, on that note, I was just going to say, before I go off on a tangent and kill this off, <laughs> I was just going to say <laughs> the, um, the link between the gut and the brain. Now, mm -hmm. the new studies are linking, you know, obviously with the, the, the vagus nerve, is it, or the vagus nerve or something? There's yeah, like, the vagus nerve, that's yeah, right. That's right, and obviously we're, we're facing an epidemic of, of mental illness, but there's, you know, there's, there's going to be heaps of different factors which come into that, but mm -hmm. inflammation and stuff like that, um, there's quite a big link, right, between the gut and the brain. So, huge. Yeah, yeah. huge. So what, what's, your, um, what's your viewpoint on that? And what yeah, have you so... had any experiences? So, I mean, for sure, and this is, you know, this is one of the most rewarding things in my line of work because I've been a naturopathic doctor now for over 20 years and we, that's our, you know, bread and butter, basically, the gut. We basically are taught from very early on that the gut is the root of pretty much all illness. Um, and so way back then, uh, we were still being ridiculed for this notion and to actually see it come into fruition that everybody basically has agrees with that one of the most oldest of naturopathic tenants is just extremely rewarding in and in and of itself so that part is awesome but really what we're finding is that if you can imagine that i mean your gut is really the root of everything but 80 percent of your immune system basically lives in your digestive tract right so take that in for a moment and that that you are every day, every time you eat something, you are in the process of turning a foreign subject into self, into cells and th things that make you work. So that alone is pretty miraculous. Mm. So, you know, um, I actually forgot your question now because oh, I'm always like, I'm like, what was the Yeah, question? no, I know. Yeah, I see you're passionate about it. That's <laughs> fine. I always do that. I was uh, just going to say real quickly then. So it sounds like it becomes a part of you then. That bacteria actually becomes a part of you then by the sounds of it. Well, no, the bacteria don't, but they, we have a symbiotic relationship with right. these organisms, right? Meaning that they do things for us and we do things for them. We are the host. We feed them, right? Mm -hmm. So this, it, the idea of brain health is where we were going with that. But what yep. we are finding through science, and some of you may have heard this already, but um, a few years ago, uh, we've completed, scientists completed what's known as the Human Genome Project, right? Where we actually looked at, all right, humans are the most complex beings on the planet how many genes do we actually have and we expected millions of genes but turns out that we have just about as many as the potato right mm -hmm. we actually have as many genes as a regular white potato which was absolutely stunning to scientists it's something like 20 to 40 thousand genes we yeah. have Right. So what then came along is the human microbiome project, which looked at bacterial DNA. And what they found is that that bacteria far outnumber um, or the bacterial DNA far outnumbers the human DNA. So essentially, we're just like you remember that men in black movie where there's like there's a human being and then actually it, oh, the brain opens up and there's a tiny alien. That's yeah. what I always think about in this like, you know. Uh, it's sort of like controlling the human being. And yeah. in a way, bacteria also are thought to actually um, control a lot of human function, including inflammation and, um, uh, you know, signals to the brain through the vagus nerve. It's a bidirectional. So it's not just gut brain, but also brain gut. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of information going back and forth and constantly sampling. Um, uh, additionally, we have uh, really aggressive bacteria um, in the gram-negative uh, group that in their cell wall have substances that are some of the most inflammatory substances known to man. So if you have a lot of those bacteria and you feel depressed, you're achy all over or just randomly achy and sort of just not firing on all cylinders, it's very possible that that actually comes from your gut and the antidepressant you're taking is not really working for you. Mm. That's it because and, – and what would you say – the because there's so many kind of factors which come into it, right, when it comes to mental health, and it's, it's so complicated. But I was just going to – I've got so many questions all at once, but um, I'm just going to say that when it comes to um, inflammation, I've read a really good book recently called Inflamed Mind, and um, it's really, really fascinating. But what I've noticed is because I've – just using competitions again as an example, now I've connected the dots, but I've done like – 
competitions and modeling uh, shoots where I haven't focused as much on the nutrients I'm eating. I've just purely been focused on calories and I haven't been eating as clean, if you like. I've been eating a bit more, you know, factoring in some processed foods and whatnot. And I look, my stomach looks completely different. It's, it's now looking back, I realize it was inflammation. But mm-hmm. when I was eating, whenever I went into a show and I was dialed and eating super, you know, um, nutrient dense foods, it was night and day the difference in how my actual midsection looked. So it goes to show that inflammation is is actually you know quite common. Yeah, it plays a big part in in things, even with brain yeah. health. It's inflammation, but I would also say that, um, you know, it's really common for people to uh, reach for highly processed foods like mm. energy, like the drinks, the energy drinks and the, the like they're super dense with fat and with sugar and things like that. Or like, you know, those those um, instant meal drinks and, and adding in all kinds of stuff to their protein shake and a lot of sugary stuff. And if you get a lot of bloating with sugar um that could very well also mean that you have a fungal overgrowth you know i mean i see a lot of people that that as kids for example they may have had tons of ear infections or asthma or um, chest infections and they got antibiotic after antibiotic and then as they got older they got onto this health kick and they started to clean up their diet and and here they are they're they're really into fitness and um but they still get a lot of sugar cravings and, and they have bloating with sugar. And I would say a lot of that can be yeast overgrowth because anytime you take an antibiotic, which is sometimes important but way over prescribed, um, even by conventional standards, they're mm-hmm. starting to really scale back the amount of antibiotics that P, uh, GPs and doctors are prescribing simply because we're seeing so much resistance now with, with bacteria and not responding pr- appropriately to antibiotics. But basically, anytime you take an antibiotic, you are killing off a large number of normal bacteria that are there to do their job, as well as the pathogens, right? The ones mm. that you're trying to target. And then in its place, you can actually have a yeast growth, which is not affected by the antibiotics. And so yeast, I see that just as commonly, if not more commonly, um, in, in people with digestive disorders and brain fog is very common. Fatigue is very common. Um, also joint pain and that's less due to the inflammation. Um, but more due to the, what we call endotoxins or substances that yeast can release like tartaric acid, um, et cetera, that can actually deplete certain nutrients from your body. So it gets really fascinating, um, way beyond just inflammation. Um, when we actually look at what's happening when somebody has a yeast overgrowth. Mm. And would you recommend any, again, I know it's, there's lots of variables here, but in terms of like, uh, you know, pro-inflammatory foods, for example, right? Uh, like yeah. vegetable oil. I mean, there's lots of research to show that actually certain types of vegetable oil, once, once they cook them, uh, turn into a trans vat, which can be extremely uh-huh. uh, inflammatory on the gut. So is, is, is there any foods which you think are like pro-inflammatory in general? Or, yeah, or, or not necessarily, fats, yeah. or, or just like bad for your gut in general. Sorry. Yeah, so not just gut because I mean the gut. Yeah, that's that. Um, I think that it's not going to be the foods that I'm going to mention are not just going to be bad for the gut, but basically mm. bad for anyone. And trans fats would definitely be uh, top of my list because they're so damaging to. Um, pretty much all cells because cells the cell wall is made out of lipids or fats right so if you de- if you actually start replacing some of those fats with trans fats it's really bad news right so mm-hmm. that would be like you mentioned vegetable oils that that are solid at room temperature like margarine and and so forth um and also just vegetable oils that you cook with it's not a good idea olive oil is the exception that's really good very mm-hmm. healthy and coconut oil of course as well that's but what I also use, yeah. in in moderation i'm not a huge fan of just ladling uh, coconut oil into the smoothies and stuff i think that's really unnecessary mm. um so other foods would include top of the other you know list would be um sugar uh, any kind of processed sugar um, any sort of processed food that has a lot of white flour, vegetable fat, and sugar, right? So mm-hmm. most of the, the commercial cakes um, and lollies, that type of thing, is just not very healthy at mm. all. What about and the common you know, go-to foods? Sorry to interrupt. Like, you know, like mm-hmm. the foods like cereal, bread, pasta, people are still in the habit of eating those kind of foods, but those kind of things can be bad as well, right? Sure. Any That's still processed. Like, yeah. look at cornflakes. That's completely processed. I know. 
So, um, I mean, you're talking to a naturopathic doctor. It's, it's like a long time since I've even smelled a cornflake, mm. you know. Yeah, <laughs> no, I know. Eat that, so I don't. Like, <laughs> it's so foreign to me. But people, and I, most of my patients, luckily, don't do that. So, mm. so instead, start your day. Like a great day would be to have a protein shake for breakfast. By all means, have a protein shake, and maybe use not always whey protein, uh, which is from a cow, but use also plant-based proteins like hemp protein or mm -hmm. golden pea, which is a really good uh, vegetable or vegetarian type of or vegan really protein. But make sure it's a really good source. And mix it with maybe organic, um, you know, almond milk or something like that. There's a lot of fillers in a lot of these al milk alternatives, but you can easily make your own by just having, you know, throwing a handful of cashews or almonds into a blender and then add water, for example. That's easy. And some frozen berries or fresh berries. Berries are really uh, very much packed with, or the blue skin um, is really packed with phytonutrients and um, substances that are really anti-inflammatory. So, but ideally you want to have berries that are colored all the way throughout, like um, elderberries, which are difficult, of course, to find commercially. Mm. But, uh, you know, the blueberries that are commercially grown, that are white inside, are going to be less healthy or less um, vibrant as the um what are they called the elder um they're not elderberries oh, but they're, it's totally es escaping me right now it'll come back to me um but you can you can buy all sorts of berries you know raspberries are great because they're red all the way throughout so really really colorful vegetables is what you want vegetables and fruit and if you i'm much more of a vegetable person than a fruit person Same. just because it's you know you can pack so much more nutrient density into vegetables and um the sugars are just an issue with fruit and mm. you know, if you if you have like 10 fruit a day that's just too much because exactly. your liver can't handle that much fructose, fructose so, yeah. yeah so and what would you say in terms of vegetables like what would you recommend the average person in terms of servings of vegetables per day i know it's broad but right and so what i can tell you is what science tells us right yeah. so if actually um, reach the goal which is always my personal goal and I'm pretty close to it and most days I meet it is 10 cups of vegetables a okay. day right yep. so 10 cups of vegetables what we know from research is that practically every disease known to us is going to be curbed by that right wow. so any chronic illness cancer I mean we can't say that just eating 10 cups of broccoli every day is going to do that but mm. The chances are pretty good. So especially if you, um, and we're just talking about minimizing risks, right? But if you think about heart disease, hypertension, everything that we that we know of is um, can be really helped by eating more vegetables. As simple as that sounds, but it's true. Yep. And the more colorful, the better. So really eating a rainbow, eating your tomatoes, eating. Um, you know, your carrots and purple carrots and all kinds of different mm. vegetables rather than always the, uh, um, you know, store-bought um, flavor saver tomato, which is mm. not the same as an organic tomato that you buy at, a buy at a farmer's market. Of course, that's not available to everyone, but do the best you can. Exactly. You know, and buy your vegetables. Um, there's a great website called the ewg.org, the mm -hmm. environmental workinggroup.org, which is a non-profit group that looks at um, the effects of toxins on, on our bodies. And mm -hmm. so they always have a great list called the Clean 15. Yeah, I've um, heard of that. The Dirty Dozen, right? The Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15, which are 15 vegetables that you, um, well, the Dirty Dozen is a list of vegetables that you really should eat organic. And yep. that's like apples, um, I think celery is in there. Those kinds of things, and then the you know the clean fifteen are foods that you can get get away with not really buying organic, and that's like avocado. Yeah, with and the thick onion. skin and stuff. Um, yeah, exactly. And bananas, maybe. Yeah. Mm. So start there. You know, just maybe uh, if your goal is to become healthier in 2019, then maybe starting to eat more vegetables. Now, if you bloat with vegetables, then maybe um, you have some digestive issue that can be remedied you might need more enzymes or you might have SIBO or you know so so don't be discouraged um, if you 
if you think, well, I can't handle vegetables, I'm just mm. too reactive, there is an answer for that. Exactly, and that's it. And if, if it's a listener, a lot of the listeners I know, sense? oh yeah, that makes total sense. And a lot of the people listening, I guess, well, not a lot of them, but some of them probably don't eat any vegetables. So I would just say, even if you were to start off with like four or five cups, that's a, that's a small win, right? So just gradually trying to build that up and, and getting used to eating them, I guess. I'd say really, yeah. It's right. And so if you, if you want to know like what are the best maybe three vegetables mm, to start with, I would definitely put broccoli in that list. Mm -hmm. You know, broccoli is a, a fantastic vegetable. Um, I also think tomato and with tomato, it's actually great if you cook it. It does release a bit more vegetable. Mm. I mean, uh, nutrients and stuff on like that, on that note. And oh, sorry. Go on. What, what, else, what does it release? Mm. Sorry about that. You, I didn't realize. What were you saying then? It, it releases... Um, like lutein and, yep. um, you know, there's, there's different types of nutrients that are in tomatoes, but they're pretty, they're really good for eyesight and, mm, and, uh, circulation and, and yeah. things like that, you know? Mm. Um, I mean, I, there's so many vegetables that are wonderful. And then obviously, um, vegetables like kale, there can be a little bit harder to digest. Mm -hmm. Um, but things like, you know, carrots are wonderful. Celery is wonderful. So start with the really simple ones and yep. then maybe graduate to shiitake mushrooms or, mm. you know. Yeah, 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 exactly. Those types of things, yeah. Start broadening the horizon a bit. Yeah, no, I was going to say, what's your thoughts on, like, for example, the nightshade family, such as tomatoes, eggplant, I don't know, white potato and, like, capsicum? Because I've, I've heard they contain s certain, like, proteins, maybe is it lectins, which can be toxic on the gut and stuff like that? Is that, is that something? Right. Because I sometimes get issues. I'm just trying to put my finger on stuff myself, that's all. <laughs> Yeah, so, okay, so this is not a new um, thought. I know that recently it's been popularized by um, someone who has actually a financial gain in selling supplements that are supposedly right. lectin shields, right? Surprise, and surprise. I think that it's really doing a disservice to vilify vegetables hmm. by saying, oh, they have all these toxins in it. We've known about um, the nightshade family or the solanaceae that contain solanine, which is actually... Um, also a particular type of food substance that in those that are sensitive can cause symptoms. And, you know, just like with histamine intolerance or uh, salicylate sensitivities, like lots of different sensitivities. But we have co-evolved with these vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. So they are very familiar to us. We've had tomatoes for a while now and potatoes. I mean, yes, they have migrated through different areas and not everyone's had potatoes for hundreds of thousands of years. But for, for all intents and purposes, I think that um, to, to, to think that you should take a supplement before you can handle a vegetable, I just think that's crazy. It's a joke. So, yeah. yeah, so I don't really subscribe to that idea, but I do know that for some people it can cause joint pain, like potato... Um, can do that, uh, like like you, all the vegetables that you mentioned are part of the nightshade. So if you have joint pain or some other issues, wh whenever you eat eggplant, tomato, and potato, and capsicum, or peppers, for those of you listening in America, then then just maybe take that food group out for a while and see how you do without it. Um, I think that's that's important, but I think they're, they're wonderful vegetables that mm. I to live without absolutely yeah i don't think it's very important when it comes to like say for example someone's eating no vegetables i think the least of their worries is eating a tomato right so exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah. um i was yeah. just i was just gonna say um in terms of uh, poor gut health do you think there's a link to i know once again like it's, it's lifestyle factors you know for example people don't you know they eat more than they eat more calories than their body needs and the wrong types of foods and maybe not moving enough but do you think poor gut health can lead or can can contribute to obesity and chronic illness sure we know that without yep. a shadow of a doubt and we know that because through like different areas of research but for example one um sort of therapy that's gaining popularity is called fecal microbiota transplants, right? Mm, Which that. is basically putting the poo of a healthy person into the, into the body of a sick person. So it's done through a colonoscopy where they actually put the poo into the colon of a, of a sick person. And they have cured certain diseases, right? So 
um, like there's a there's a condition called C. difficile diarrhea, which is very common if you get antibiotics in the hospital. It's really very violent diarrhea, and they like a 98% cure rate if they take the poo of a healthy person and put it into the colon of that unhealthy person. Mm. So and what, basically they're translocating the healthy microbiome to a sick microbiome. But what they also found in that research is that if they take um, insert like it, this, these are my studies, but they, they take the microbiome of an obese mouse and put it into a thin mouse and the thin mouse will get fat because yeah. and no, no changes in diet. So we do know that there are a lot of aspects to the microbiome and certain aspects of, um, of what they produce, what, what, what are called obesogens, right? Obesogens are, um, Either either effects of bacteria, so like for example, Methanobrevibacter smithii, which is an organism, not really a bacteria, but but a really interesting creature that slows transit right through the gut, and the pr the purpose of that was so that you could extract more calories, which was evolutionarily very very advantageous, right? It was very good uh, for people that were starving to mm. actually extract more calories from food, but of course it's havoc for anyone living in the western world mm, absolutely. with a with a calorie excess you know yeah so so that those links definitely we know are very real for people mm, i was going to mention that. i'm glad you mentioned that the studies with rats uh, or mice or whatever with the um yeah it's crazy changing the gut flora and actual the other mouse was then obese without actually changing anything else it's, it goes to show mm -hmm. i know i know obviously it's not done in humans but we're very Similar, I guess, to in terms of our DNA. What, what are, in terms of rats? Just so the listeners know, like I don't know if you know, but what what are we in terms of our DNA? Are we like we're very close to to a rat with our DNA, right? We're we're pretty much close to. A, if you think of that, we're very similar to a potato. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're far away couch from couch potatoes, yeah. Yeah, but there's a little bit of a different rat. Rodents are different from, um, you know, are are a little bit different from from humans in in certain aspects. But like you know, we're super close to chimps and apes yeah. in general. Um, I can't. I don't know the exact number mm. of DNA um, similarities, but it's it's got to be. More than a potato, I mm. would think. That's okay then. I was just curious. Mammals, people right? Always... We're still mammals, so. Exactly. Yeah. And I was just, I've mentioned certain studies before, and people are like, yeah, well, they haven't been done in humans. It's just rats, so it's absolute bullshit. Well, you know? they have been done <laughs> totally in humans, you know. So I have heard, um, uh, like, and there are a lot of case studies of people mm. doing FMT or fecal microbiota transplant um, that that get depressed afterwards and the donor was depressed, you know? So mm. there's a lot of different aspects of it that I think we're just, um, it's too new that the, the, the modality is too new to really e extrapolate a lot of data from across, um, you know, I mean, I think in the next f five to 10 years, we're going to understand it a lot better, mm. but yeah. So there, there are a lot of, um, things that I see people that have done FMTs because I see a lot of people that have failed FMT um, come to me and so the, the things that they tell me you know mm -hmm. is very interesting that they've experienced after FMT mm. interesting it's, and I was, I was just going to say about stress and stuff because uh, most of you know a lot of people this day and age I guess we're more kind of stressed than ever now because we were we're overstimulated you know with technology and stuff and just the lifestyle the poor lifestyle you know having more food available to us than ever uh, any point in human history is playing a part on stress but um yeah like stress I guess plays a big part as well do you, do you notice a link between um I, I know this stress is a, is a is a very like wide word if you like but that plays a part do you find in some people uh, in terms of their gut disorders or it's probably the number one cause of gut disorders. I'm not saying the stress has caused it, mm -hmm. but it's the number one contributing factor, what I see in chronic gut issues. Mm -hmm. And if you think that we have two phases in our nervous system, right, uh, or responses, you've heard of the fight or flight, Yes. Um, but there's also another one called rest and digest, mm -hmm. right? And these are all aut automatic sort of um, nervous system responses that are sort of imperceptible to us in a way. I mean, we know when we're stressed, when we go into fight or flight, and and that is an ancient response to um, really life-threatening situations that we had to run away from, but they didn't last all day. They lasted maybe 10 minutes or a half an hour, or you actually um, died, right? So mm -hmm. It was only really, really short spurts during the day that you were exposed to the fight or flight. But nowadays, with um, so much stress, so much worry, 
so many different stimuli, as you've mentioned, we're mm -hmm. in that fight or flight much, much more and much longer. And what happens is basically the physiology is that when you are in a fight or flight, your body wants to get ready to run, right? Your, your body wants to basically run away from the perceived threat and get rid of anything that it doesn't need. So if you've ever been nervous before a competition or before public speaking and you had diarrhea, that's what that is. It's basically just, you know, getting rid of the ballast, you know, so, yep. um, and you are then able to run or to get away from the perceived threat. The rest and digest is the complete opposite. And that's when we're actually, um, you know, secreting digestive juices and really allowing our body to extract nutrients. In the fight or flight, you actually do not make very much stomach acid at all. And you are your body is not prepared for food. So imagine if you're very busy and you have, uh, you know, 10 minutes for a lunch break and you're wolfing down your lunch and you're still really stressed. You're not really optimizing digestion that way at all. So I do think that um, chronic stress is probably one of the most important aspects of gut health or the mm. lack thereof. Mm. Yeah, that totally, totally makes sense. I like the way you put that. I never thought of it like that. When you get diarrhea and stuff like that and when you're nervous, it's because your body's trying to get rid of <laughs> the waste for you to do a runner, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Before yeah, I like that. Literally, you're doing a runner. <laughs> you're literally <laughs> doing a runner. Yeah, no pun intended there. <laughs> uh, I was going to say about um, fermented foods as well. Is, it, is there any particular types of fermented foods you recommend? I know, once again, it depends on what kind of disorder your, your clients have and stuff. And I don't know whether that plays a part in SIBO, but are there any fermented foods which you kind of um, toy around with yourself? Or Look, I am a huge fan of fermented foods. Uh, fermented foods... Basically, um, if it's vegetable type of fermented food like um, uh, sauerkraut and the, the different types of fermented vegetables that are available now, they it's mostly Lactobacillus plantarum, which is a type of probiotic that's that is you know wonderful for a lot of different uh, reasons, and it's actually a, a very researched strain of a probio of of or a species of probiotic. So. I like that. I like sauerkraut juice. I like um, for, like anything fermented, I, like miso, mm -hmm. yogurt. I like all of it. Yogurt and animal products contain more bifidobacteria, yep. which is often uh, really colonic. Uh, has has a lot of role in colonic issues like um, constipation and stuff. Although dairy can be quite constipating, so you know everybody is really different. Um, and I can't say categorically that yogurt is more for the colon and uh, sauerkraut is more for small intestinal stuff. But fermented foods do play a role and eating more fermented foods can really help. Now, one thing I will say about your microbiome, which again is are all the beneficial bacteria that have sort of symbiotically evolved uh, with you. They cannot be replaced by fermented foods or capsules of probiotics. That's a that's a misconception uh, of uh, sort of for the longest time we thought we just reseed the digestive tract with with probiotics after antibiotics and just give it what it, what it needs. Well, mm -hmm. that's not really how it works. You have your own native species that you cultivate throughout your life and if you lose them you have to cultivate them back you have to use foods and prebiotics like we've mentioned the bit different fibers um the, you know to actually help your own microbiome to come back you can't just take something from a capsule or something from a jar and imagine that it's going to repopulate your own microbiome that just simply does not happen mm. but probiotics are great for particular immune um, modulation they're basically uh, metabolic modulators, I would say, and they are really helpful in, in in promoting the growth of certain organisms, but they cannot replace what you've lost. Mm. Could you recommend any kind of probiotics? Because um, I don't know if you've heard of mod biotics as well. Have you heard of mod biotics? Never heard of it. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm not. You know, just bear in mind that I use extremely professional brands mm, and straight specific. You. Mm. Very strain specific probiotics. And so, you know, there are some that are far more researched than others, like mm. Lactobacillus plantarum 299V is an incredible probiotic strain and found in several different products. Mm -hmm. um, also, Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, super, super organism that's very helpful to modulate inflammation. 
and then there's like so many um, that are for partic- for different things like mm. hydrogen sulfide or constipation or methane production or like you know like yeah. so I I'm much more like a wizard that kind of uses strain specific probiotics for different reasons and not just like well here's a probiotic yeah. let's see what it does that, that's what i was going to say then i was going to say do you, like for the average listener who's getting some like i don't know some yeah. gut issues could you recommend like a, a prebiotic but then i guess it, you know you, you specialize on you adapt to the person right so it's just right. too complex it, i would agree with that yeah yeah that's that's totally fine you literally uh, i've just realized what the time is now we'll two more quick questions i was just going to say yeah. what ask you what your thoughts were on like different types of fasting and intermittent fasting because um mm-hmm. it's just from my own personal experience Experience. Uh, that's the only thing I, I do. I've been I'm accustomed to fasting as well. I've been doing intermittent fasting for years, and it works really well for me, my lifestyle, and I feel better, my energy levels and whatnot. But when I do get gut issues, um, like now, for example, I'm towards the end of a fast. I've probably this is a bit extreme. This never really happens, but this is like about maybe 19, 20 hours into a fast because I've had gut, gut issues, and that that is the only thing that seems to really work. Um, every time, really, when I just basically stop putting stuff in there. <laughs> um, but yeah, what are your yeah. thoughts on fasting and uh, yes, fasting. great question. And therapeutic fasting is, has been in our tool belt as naturopathic doctors for a very long time. We mm-hmm. do it for any sort of inflammatory reaction. If you have rheumatoid arthritis and you're in an acute flare, mm. and if you go on a water fast, um, you know, for a few days, there's nothing that can stem the inflammation as as quickly as that, in my experience. And intermittent fasting has become more and more popular because of Michael Mosley's book, The 5-2 yeah. Diet and great. all that, love, which is yeah. great. Yeah. I love it, too. It's his fabulous. Book, his book, I mean, is great. Yeah. 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 And the idea of in, like periodically resting the system is a fantastic way to get all, rid of the old and do some cell renewal. Mm-hmm. And there's some um, incredible research by Dr. Longo. He's an Italian researcher on uh, therapeutic fasting for those who want to take it a bit fur- further. Um, it's really incredible because he looks at the different inflammatory mediators. He tracks them and he, and, you know, he does it especially for um, – uh, like uh, during chemotherapy, for example, mm, I've and I've, I've recommended it for some of my patients that were undergoing chemotherapy and they had like zero side effects when they actually wow. did a 24 to 48 hour fast before the chemotherapy, which is so difficult mentally, mm. but they had zero side effects, which wow. was incredible. Do you yeah. think that's mainly oh. to do with the, uh, is it autophagy where the immune cells, the immune cell, uh, the, the immune system kind of reproduces? Do you think it's mainly to do with that or is it probably several factors? Well, autophagy, as we call it, but uh, it's, sorry, I can't it's, it. autophagy, it's probably <laughs> another way to pronounce it, tomato, tomato, oh, but it's sort yeah. of like, it's just a process where the body consumes itself. And, and that is also what happens. But I think more like the, the side effects mitigation due to fasting is probably more due to that you're really completely resting any sort of, um, energy going out for digesting and yep. for uh, immune activation so that you can really just focus on processing the extremely toxic substances that are chemotherapy, right? So mm. so that's part of it. I think the autophagy comes in, um, I think, independent of the chemotherapy, obviously. And that's that. the wonderful thing with therapeutic fasting is that it selectively looks for damaged cells as a a first source of fuel for itself right Mm. so that's the wonderful thing of rejuvenation with uh with with fasting and it it, that uh, effect is really pronounced as you uh go uh you know as the days progress the one most important thing that people really don't respect with therapeutic fasting is that you must rest Mm -hmm. right during process if you're out there working out and doing your thing you're actually negating some of the effects of therapeutic fasting Mm, just more stress isn't it yeah so you really you actually have to respect your body to try to renew itself right and that energy you probably have seen it initially your energy goes up but that as it goes on you're really getting tired and that is important to allow your body to um, actually you know use that little energy to repair itself Awesome, yeah, yeah. Because I, I'm actually lying, really, because when I when I say fasted, I still have like uh, like one or two black coffee, so that's not quite the same as it is fasting, anyway. <laughs> well, black coffee is a non-caloric substance, but that's it right. is a 
a lot of fasting. You're correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, and literally, this is the last question. Um, I just wanted to say, um, in terms of the clients, the I don't know how many clients, probably lost count, lots of different clients uh, you've actually dealt with. Have you noticed um, the people have managed to, for example, lose weight uh, and body fat and actually um, improve their state of health in terms of like weight loss and stuff like that, as, as well as other factors of their life um, once, once they've repaired their gut? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I would say the main thing is um, individualizing the diet, right? Mm -hmm. So really finding what, what makes your body sing and what makes it be as vibrant as possible. And, um, you know, for some it is a vegetarian diet and for some it isn't. And so I'm never married to one idea of this is the diet for everyone. I think there are individual um or individualities there. Yeah. But definitely curbing inflammation is probably the biggest factor for people when they have very stubborn weight loss issues um, where they can't get rid of the pounds. And so uh, food sensitivities, inflammation, eating the wrong diet, um, all, and, and also I look at hormones, of course. If, if there are... Uh, if there's no reason, I have a few patients that are just really stubborn with weight loss. And mm. um, I, I'd say the number one reason is that their detoxification system, I have had at least probably, um, I don't even know now over the years, probably hundreds. But in the recent times, um, there were probably about five or six that had very, very impaired detoxification mechanisms. And they just couldn't lose every time they even went on a diet they got sick um and so you know that's that's a bit a bit extreme and that's not everyone but i'm a big fan of individualizing each treatment for each client or cool. patient great right that's great that i just realized that's like an hour of your time i really really appreciate that um just what, <laughs> no what, worries. Uh, that was like literally there was so much uh, helpful yeah. information you pretty much covered everything and more that i was going to ask you so thanks a lot for that um, and I was just going to ask you um, where the audience can find you uh, online, I guess. Sure. So I have um, I have a lot of different uh, web presences, but my uh, clinic is called thebiomeclinic.com, and they are you know we, we're in we're in um, northern New South Wales and Australia. Um, that's where I have other practitioners work here. If you are looking for somebody that specializes in gut health, we do do Skype visits and all that. Um, and also I have my prof sort of professional education website is called the SIBOdoctor.com and there's quizzes and free handouts and lots of information and you can find me on Facebook on the SIBOdoctor.com or SIBO test is another thing, uh, another business where we actually sell uh, breath test kits to help diagnose SIBO. So I'm sort of everywhere, you know, even awesome. Instagram, even though I'm, I'm 50 plus and I'm just learning about Instagram. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just figuring that out. And so I'm, I'm just foraying into that. But yeah, there's a lot of great information on all these different sites if you wanting to get more information. That's great. I'll add the links for your site and for, you know, Instagram and Facebook onto the show notes anyway, so the uh, listeners can access that. But yeah, once again, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it, Norella. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks very much.